Hi, this is Larry Bauer, Chief Executive Officer of the Family Medicine Education Consortium. And today I'm talking with Dr. Catherine Florio Pipus, a family physician who is a professor at the Department of Community and Family Medicine at Dartmouth University. She is an educator, a clinician, a researcher in areas of health and wellness, a speaker, and most recently, an author of, of a book. Dr. Pipus, thanks so much for joining with us. Larry, it's my pleasure. Thank you. So, Dr. Pipus, by way of background, can you tell us how you came to medicine and to, to family medicine? Well, I um, came to medicine by way of um, interest in, in, in looking at both the sciences and um, my passion for people. I think I wound up in family medicine because it continued to open doors. I was a medical student at Jefferson Medical College and had a phenomenal opportunity to work with two family docs, husband and wife, and at that point I fell in love and I was advised as someone who loved every area that I worked in as a student that family medicine would be right for me and I have um, felt that was that was valid throughout my whole career. Fantastic. And and so what got you uh, interested in the area of um, burnout and wellness? Well, unfortunately, my own experiences. Um, I've been um, wearing multiple different hats and roles at Dartmouth and found myself um, in quite a few leadership positions, as well as going back and um, acting as a student. In 2011, I went back to Dartmouth and got an MPH at the Dartmouth Institute and um, recall sitting at graduation, um, looking around in the eyes of my classmates and hearing the speaker say, you know, go out there and cure cancer and save the world and um, heal everyone and thinking about um, my own life and, and those that I was looking at and seeing and realizing they're not eating well and taking care of ourselves and, you know, not seeing our families or, or doing the things that we were preaching, really. Um, and it, it made me think, well, what about us? Where's the message to take care of ourselves? And it was really at the same point that we were starting to see a lot of the data um, it, it showing the impact of burnout, the rising levels and the impact not just on us as physicians, but also on our healthcare systems and um, particularly on our patients. And so um, it's really an area that's extremely rewarding because it forces me to walk the walk, but it's also rewarding because I see the need by so many of my students and colleagues um, to be able to prioritize their own health and look at ways of changing our culture and our system to support us um, taking care of ourselves. So I had an opportunity, and thank you for sharing your book uh, early on with me. I had an opportunity to read it. And the thing that really struck me is your vision of providing patient care as, as, as a healing. Each of the cases that you uh, discuss, each of the patients, each of the scenarios, you talk about how a family physician responds to that patient, that family, that problem. And, and I just, honestly, I heard Hippocrates uh, in, in uh, the background, uh, it's really powerful vision as a healer. Could you comment on that? Yeah, and, I mean, it, it gives me shivers in some ways um, because, to be honest, the stories that I've written for years, Larry, as a physician around patients and the learnings I've had for them hit me as a teaching, not just for the for myself, but for other colleagues. And so we're all patients in, in essence. And so the stories that I wrote are ways that we can learn from our patients um, and turn around and pass that back on to both other patients and colleagues. And so I've had, you know, journals since I was a medical student collecting little tidbits of what I've learned. Many of them initially may have been around lab values or very concrete facts. Um, and, and more recently, I realized that these are themes and these are strategies of of how people adapt to challenges and how they, you know, can continue to do difficult things, both in physical health and in mental health, emotional health, um, despite the challenges that are around them. And so there's no no group that's immune to this, certainly not physicians. And um, we're we're not invincible to the, you know, behaviors that affect health. And so we have to really prioritize these for ourselves. And so my my book is a it's really a gift that I give back to others, but it's material that I got from them. So it's um, each chapter is a learning that I had 
Um, and each chapter is illustrated, as you said, by a patient's story. Um, it's also backed by the sciences. And so I've incorporated the evidence for these strategies. And then each chapter has um, exercises that individuals, and I believe everyone from, you know, high school students up to, you know, health presidents of healthcare systems can use to apply to their life and, and to then create cultures of wellness um, and systems that are different from the ones we have that support one another. That's wonderful. So one of the things that uh, maybe you could comment on your experience working with students, residents, and clinicians, how, how are people responding to the message that you're trying to share about taking care of self? I think it's a welcome message, um, but it's not always a comfortable or a known message. I think in some ways it's really a, a paradigm shift because we have been trained and we have thus trained others that in medicine we have to prioritize our patients and we give to others. And I don't want to say that that's not correct, but I think um, what we have seen over the years is that when we give to others at our own expense, it's not helpful to others either. And so we've got to shift that and we say we have to take care of ourselves first. And, and some people, and, and even myself, when I say that, I still have a little bit of a cringe. Like, how can I put myself first? But it's not a, it's not a, um, a, a selfish act. It's not a weakness um, to need to, to do self-care. It's really an act of prioritizing, you know, similar to when you get on a plane and put your own mask on first before helping others, that if we're not healthy, whether it's emotional, spiritual, mental, financial, if we're not healthy, then we're not going to be as effective um, as we could be to promote health in others. And so it's really, it's a message that people are welcoming, but they're also a little fearful because our culture has shamed ourselves. We've shamed ourselves. Um, we've said often that when you need help, you you know, you need mental health time, whatever, it, the stigma of that is really potent. Um, and we've seen it as a weakness. We've seen it as, you know, that you're, you're um, not capable. Um, and we've shamed ourselves and others. And so we've got to turn around our thinking. Um, but all of the classes and the workshops and the seminars and the speaking that I've done, and it's been a broad range of audiences from nurse practitioners to medical students, residents, frontline people, hospital dean, hospital presidents, medical school deans. Everyone is welcoming this conversation because we need to break down those barriers. We need to acknowledge our vulnerabilities and we need to be able to create time and tools and give ourselves permission to do exactly what we are asking our patients to do. No more, no less. In our previous conversations, you've talked about the importance of metrics where for a health system, for example, there might be some way of uh, measuring how um, well the health system does in terms of supporting the, the uh, clinicians, uh, the doctors, the nurses, the nurse practitioners, et cetera. Could you uh, speak to that issue? Yes, I, I have loved this idea, and, and it's been very exciting to me to pick people's brains and get some creative juices going around the idea of how would we actually measure, you know, how should we be ranking our hospitals and our departments and, 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 and measuring the success of our individual faculty members and students and programs. And I think at some point, my vision is it's going to look very different than it does now. And certainly we can't give up the, the revenue-based uh, metrics, but if it has something that balance those out, I think our our costs would come down, our health care would be better, um, and our outcomes would be better for patients. And some of those may include, you know, again, throwing out just interesting ideas, you know, leadership training for everyone. What degree do people have leadership training that would include um, improvement work and understanding improvement processes that they could apply to themselves, to their team, to their systems? That's something that is having momentum. Um, thanks to ACGME and other policies. Also, um, vacation time. It's something that seems very simple, but um, when we compare the U.S. to other countries, you know, our, our data shows people don't take vacation. And what would it be like to have a hospital ranked based on what percent of their people have taken all of the vacation or what percent of a team sits down and has lunch each day or actually walks outside of the hospital for 10 minutes and gets, you know, some nature and exposure? So there, I think there's different ways of us, um, in meaningful and measurable ways, looking at outcomes that really matter. 
So I tell people this story that when I started in medicine, uh, admittedly some years ago, there was a thing called lunch. And people <laughs> would get together. We, we would even go out to lunch occasionally together, little team formation. Uh, and that gradually, in fact, I trained for a marathon during, quote, lunch, uh -huh. where a group of us would go out for a run together. And then in the uh, 80s and the 90s, that disappeared, and you filled it in with meeting, meeting, meetings. And uh -huh. I don't think people really quite understand that for most docs, they're going, even if they're not surgeons, they're going from 7 a.m. in the morning well into the evening with grabbing food as they can, trying to keep up, keep up, and, and uh, uh, produce more. Comments? No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think we underestimate the power to replenish, whether it's, or whether it's time or whether it's just a few moments of reflection. I um, was doing a workshop with a group of um, residents in our Leadership Preventive Medicine residency, and we did John Kabat-Zinn Mindfulness Exercise, which is a one-minute raisin exercise, and we focus our attention to, to demonstrate mindfulness under simple little, you know, thermal up great. And at the end of this exercise, one of the residents expressed how this was the first thing that he had tasted all month. And it was just such a potent um, validation of what you're saying that he hadn't taken the time in the last 30 days to sit down, to appreciate his food, to take a moment for himself. And, you know, we, we know that the studies of, you know, the families that eat together, sit together, because much more happens than just the digestive enzymes coming out, that you're, you're thinking, you're stopping what you're doing. And, you know, the same with the power of a 10-minute walk, to just step away from work. And some of the things I've seen that have been successful, and there's lots of strategies out there, but people who, who put on their calendars, you know, me time or whatever it is, that you're, you're getting out of the office for 10 minutes, you're circling, you're clearing your head. And once we realize the impact that that has to give us so much more energy and more performance in the afternoon, I think, again, we will be thinking about this differently. It's not... Um, it's not that I'm stepping away because I'm lazy. It's not that I'm stepping away because I can't keep up or I can't, you know, cut it. Um, it's that I'm actually focusing a little bit of replenish time on me in order to come back stronger in the rest of the day. So one of the things that's happened, thanks to your initiative, is you submitted a proposal, a workshop proposal to our meeting, the 2018 FMEC annual meeting. And it stimulated uh, discussion within our board and within our planning committee. And out of that, long story short, now is a new learning community that's forming. And the leadership group has already met. That would be yourself, Dr. Jeff Levy, Dr. Ginny Van Dyne. And next uh, week, we will be bringing together the various presenters in the track of um, programming that will be offered and talking about how to grow a long-term collaborative so that our residency programs and our medical school-based departments can begin to collaborate. I've always believed there's strength in numbers as opposed to people working alone. I think that's part of how you deal with promote wellness, actually, and promote productivity. But could you comment on the, the, the collaborative for our listeners? Yeah, and Larry, I think you deserve a lot of credit on this. This is where you do such an amazing job of pulling people together and, and acting as glue, you know, finding the resources. And, and this is, again, another content area similar to others that have, have risen as priority from time to time. But I think there is so much interest and so much passion um, for getting this right. And I haven't been to a meeting um, anywhere in the last two years that hasn't been focusing on this. And I haven't been to another school that hasn't been focusing on it. Everyone is being charged at the level of medical schools, hospitals, residency programs with putting together wellness curriculum, wellness programs. Everybody has wellness committees. And so our goal is really um, to, to understand people's needs and to help advance them. So we want to very clearly make sure everyone's educated, but I think that is going to be less of an issue. But to make sure people do understand um, what the, the issues are and the impact of burnout, particularly at the level of the individuals, the teams, and the organizations. And we want to make sure people understand and are continuing to um, explore what the factors are that contribute to burnout. 
And there's lots of models, including the National Academy of Medicine framework, different ways. Um, but then we want to do something different, I think, and help um, from a national standpoint and maybe a standardized um, standpoint of finding what this competency of wellness among health professionals should look like. Um, we, we don't have a standard competency defined. Um, and, and in doing so, I think we'll start to see what are some of those other metrics um, that can be used to measure wellness. And we're looking at, you know, not just the level of the, the hospital or the institution, but also down to the, you know, the individual, the, the faculty, resident, student level. Um, and we'd love to continue to um, support people in, in doing innovative um, solutions, but also making sure that we're starting to package um, taking what's out there on some other websites, National Academy of Medicine, and best practices, and making sure that they're being disseminated so that we can promote research and allow um, organizations to work together collaboratively across institutions and get better better results and know what's really going to make a difference over time. So I think you know we're we're all about education, we're all about collaboration, and we're certainly all about promoting um, exchange of ideas and resources. And if I can add one. Um more piece to that, I think we're all about system change. Uh, I don't think we will get to uh, reduction in burnout, increase in wellness. We've created very broken healthcare delivery systems, and we need to change the systems moving away from a production-oriented model towards a healing-oriented model. And again, going back to your wonderful book, I would recommend anybody who's listening to uh, get a copy of the book. If you want to, for those who don't really get what, how a family physician engages with patients to produce healing, Dr. Florio Pipus, I think your book is just dead on uh, in terms of the healing art that underlies the field of family medicine. Thank you, Larry. I, um, I, I am very pleased that, again, the, the book, A Doctor's Dozen, 12 Strategies for Personal Health and a Culture of Wellness, addresses exactly what you're saying. It's not that the individuals don't know how to care for themselves, but when we're within an environment that's not supportive and occasionally even toxic, it's difficult to apply things that we don't theoretically know how to do. And so um, my, my goal is that we focus on prioritizing the health and I think this collaborative and the book address that, but it's also about people who are wanting to support care and systems um, that are um, undermining uh, health processes, and also for those who are, are determined to design and implement actual curriculums around wellness. So all of those, um, anyone who has any of those interests, prioritizing their own health, supporting cultures and system change, and, and wanting to create, you know, teaching tools and curriculum, we, we are hoping will be part of our collaborative. Fantastic. Dr. Pipus, I want to thank you so much for the book that you've written and the work that you do, and thank you for talking with us today. My pleasure, Larry. Thank you for all of your efforts.